time in the Adirondacks and uh, New Hampshire doing his research um, and uh, ought to have some good insights for those of you that manage trees on your land. Bill for the introduction and uh, also thanks to Charlie and, uh, and Becky for our introductions because what I'm going to talk about really follows on what they were saying, particularly what Charlie was saying. So yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, forest pests and pathogens, and Charlie mentioned this uh, starting out, and uh, uh, I'd just like to uh, go into a little more detail than he was able to do in the time that he had. But I am going to pick up on his on his theme. This is a Google Earth image of the, of the Hudson Valley and, and a little bit beyond. Uh, the dark green area in this image, uh, you know, I put a marker on Millbrook so you get your bearings there, but uh, the dark green in this image is forested land. And so you can see we are in a landscape of primarily forested land. And it, this has come back from a situation, as Charlie described, that was nearly totally deforested 100 years ago. And so what we can say is that forests are resilient. So what's the problem? You know, I mean, we, we, we know that we really, really took these forests away 100 years ago, and now they're back. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is a number of uh, continuous uh, long-term stresses. Uh, that are affecting the forest, and the, they all interact with one another. And so the, the combination of these stresses, uh, as we're going forward, uh, leads to sort of an unpredictable future. We have, we have pests and pathogens coming in, we have climate change happening, we have air pollution, we have deer, uh, overabundance of deer, we have invasive plants. As I said, those things interact. And so, you know, if you're trying to predict what's, what the forest is going to be like in, in 50 years, I agree with Charlie, it's a zero-sum game in the canopy, so you can guess that the forest is going to be green in 50 years, but to guess which species are going to be there is, is difficult. So uh, I've got five things listed here. Uh, the last four of them, uh, climate change, air pollution, deer, invasive plants, and I'm using a, a human health analogy. Those are like uh, chronic diseases that, that sap your strength. Uh, but the first one is like getting hit by a truck. Uh, so that's a, I think that's in a completely different uh, ballpark because we have uh, invasive forest pests and diseases that are coming in and just wiping out whole species. So that's what I'm going to focus on. There's a number of these, Charlie pointed this out, um, uh, that have been uh, introduced over the years. Uh, hemlock woolly adelgid is one that I'm going to talk about, emerald ash borer, Asian longhorn beetle. But there's no number of others that I could have talked about, chestnut blight, which took away one of the dominant species on the landscape. I mean, it's still around. And, in small individuals and small populations, but it's ecologically irrelevant at this point. Gypsy moth, which was introduced in the mid-1800s and became sort of the major defoliating pests in the eastern U.S. That's on the way uh, currently. I'm not going to talk too much about it. Beach bark disease, which is, as Charlie mentioned, is taking away one of, the, one, one of the main mast crop species in the northern hardwood forests. Dutch elm disease, balsam moly delta, white pine blister rust, Dogwood, anthracnose, butternut canker, we can go on and on and on with these. Charlie, Charlie mentioned that these are being distributed everywhere, and that's true, but that doesn't mean that that distribution is even. Um, here's a map that Sandy Leopold of Forest Service put together uh, that shows the abundance of forest pests and pathogens in countywide in, in the U.S. And you can see that we are ground zero for this. And so the question comes up as to why is that? Okay, why, why are there so many here? And I think it's, uh, nobody, no, nobody really knows the answer to that question, but I think it's a combination of things. Lori, is there a problem with, uh, okay. Um, I think it's a combination of things. One is, of course, there's a lot of trade coming to the East Coast, so we, we get a lot of introduction of things in, in our trade. And the main, the main trade, uh, main aspects of trade that are important here are 
the introduction of live plant material for planting, and the second is wood packing material that's used on pallets and spools and things like that that come in that, that harbor uh, wood boring agents. So we get a lot of trade along the East Coast. The other thing that I think is important is that we share a lot of common tree species with both Europe and with Asia, and particularly with Asia. So the forests of China uh, have species of maple, they have species of oak, pine, hemlock, a lot of the species that we have here, the so those same genera occur in Asia. So uh, a, a forest in, in Asia that has evolved to deal with a particular pest, so there's an insect on, on trees in, in Asia that that has evolved with those trees so there's not a major damage agent in Asia, if that pest is brought over here, um, all of a sudden it finds a similar species which has not evolved with it. And so it doesn't have the resistance to the pest that the, that the tree species in Asia might have. And so it takes off. It finds a, it finds a wonderful home to be able to take off. And so I think that's, that's what's going on here. Let's start with the hemlock woolly adelgid. I think most of you are probably familiar with this. Um, so this is a, a, an aphid-like insect that attacks uh, eastern hemlock and Carolina hemlock, which are the two hemlock species we have in the eastern U.S. So if you were to see this uh, in the field, on the underside of hemlock twigs, it looks like this at particular times of the year, like now is a good time to see it. These are woolly, uh, white uh, sacks that are used to protect both the insects and the eggs. Uh, and the, the insects are underneath this, and the eggs are also very connected. Now, if you had a microscope and you took a closer look, this is what the insect looks like. Here's the twig, here's the hemlock needle, you're looking at the underside, these are stomates. Um, and this, this little guy here, um, this is one of the crawler stages, one of the first instar stages of this, of this bug. Uh, they go up to the base of the needle and they penetrate it and basically suck the juices out. And if you were, happen to have a, a scanning electron micrograph, microscope in your basement, you would get this picture. Here's the bug. Okay, sitting on, this is, a, this is a hemlock needle. This is the structure that attaches the needle to the twig. Uh, here's the bug, and here's what's called its stylet. That's the little tube that it puts down. And it penetrates a ray parenchyma cell inside this uh, twig and basically sucks the carbohydrates out of it. And one, one bug wouldn't cause too much of a problem uh, for the hemlock, but if you have one at the base of every single needle, or if you have more than one at the base of every single needle, well, over a number of years, it'll basically just suck the life out of the tree. And that's what happens. Now, in, in the southern U.S., where this is attacking Carolina hemlock and also eastern hemlock, um, the mortality from these things is fairly rapid. So the, so the uh, bug will get on the tree, the population will start to explode, and within four or five years, the trees die. That's true in the Smoky Mountains and in Virginia, places where, they, where this has happened. Up here, the mortality seems to be uh, a, a little more slow and a little more scattered. We're not exactly sure why that is, but we certainly have some ideas. And I'll talk about that in a second. First, let's talk about where hemlock is and where it's bugging. So the green on this map is the distribution of hemlock in the eastern U.S. That's another map from forces. Uh, and the brown and yellow are the places where this bug has, uh, has uh, been distributed. It was originally introduced in 1951 in the area near Richmond, Virginia. Um, it was assumed that, that it was brought in on someone who wanted a Japanese hemlock tree or Chinese hemlock tree for their property. It was brought into a nursery and, and was planted out. And that's where they first found it. It spread slowly at first because there isn't all that much hemlock in this area. But once it got to the mid-Atlantic states, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, it started to spread pretty rapidly in the 80s. And it has spread throughout this whole region. Most of the hemlock, larger hemlock stands have died in, in, the, uh, in New Jersey and southern New England and so forth. And as Jerry mentioned, the northern end of the range of this bug is right about here now. Uh, it's a little bit to the north of us, actually. Um, and so it has been spread. Now, one of the things that seems to limit the spread of this bug is, is uh, cold temperatures. And, uh, the research, which is mostly laboratory research, and so it's a little bit difficult to extrapolate from the field, but it suggests that um, there's very high mortality of this bug if the, if the temperature gets between minus 10 and minus 20 Fahrenheit. So a pretty cold winter night would, would kill a lot of those bugs. So I don't know if maybe I was the only one in this room when we had these cold winter nights the last winter. I'm like, yes, <laughs> listen to them die out there. Uh, so we're hoping that this not. We're hoping to knock them back a little bit, but we'll see what happens in the, in the coming year. So this is a map of uh, uh, the mi lowest minimum temperature in the eastern U.S. between January 2001 and February 2014. And as I said, the, the uh, mortality uh, 
Temperatures between minus 10 and minus 20, that's the orange and yellow on this map, not back most of the adelgids, but not all of them. It takes temperatures down around minus 30 to really kill them all. Okay, so we are, um, okay, and this map over here is the distribution of hemlock woolly adelgids in the state. And you can see it maps pretty well onto the orange in, in this map, <coughs> and even going into the yellow. That's interesting because it's green and <coughs> monitor here, but anyway. Uh, so this color here, this is the sort of minus 15 to minus 20 range. And you can see it's starting to penetrate in there. Uh, so, you know, the, it's pretty clear that the temperature is limiting the northern, northern spread of this. But as I said, that, that minus 20 degree kills a lot of them, but not all of them. And of course, the ones that survive, those are the ones that are most cold tolerant. So one thing that's happening is we can see that the, the insect is growing more cold tolerant as it moves north. It's evolving, basically, which is an interesting story in itself because the, interest, the insect itself is all parthenogenetic. It's all asexual reproduction. So essentially, all the insects of uh, hemlock woolly adelgid in the eastern U.S. are all one big clone. Uh, normally, you don't think about evolution in a clone, uh, but this, there's enough mutation in the population to allow this to happen. So we're seeing this evolution to more cold tolerance, which does not bode well for the, for the hemlocks to the north of us. Now, the other thing that's happening, of course, is climate change. And the part of the climate systems that's changing most rapidly is cold winter nights. Those cold winter nights are getting uh, not as frequent as they used to be. So both of those things would lead you to believe that this, this hemlock woolly adelgid is likely to spread throughout uh, the region that's that's yellow here into the blue, mm -hmm. perhaps even into the, eventually into the, the darker blue areas. What are the impacts of hemlock woolly adelgid? Well, it's a little bug, but it has some pretty big effects. So the first thing, of course, is it's killing a major tree. And this, this tree that it's killing is our main old growth species. Charlie runs a lot of models into, into the future, and it's often hemlock that dominates the forest if he lets the model go a thousand years into the future because it's the most shade-tolerant tree. It's the one that's most able to reproduce under the canopy. Uh, so it kills this tree, and there's a lot of effects of the disturbance itself. Uh, for instance, you know, I do a lot of work on forest nutrient cycling. We know that when forests die, uh, they lose control over the nutrient cycles and you get a lot of nutrient loss into the streams that tends to produce increased nitrogen and other chemicals in stream water, which can have effects downstream. Uh, we know there's changes in wildlife. There's a study in Connecticut that showed that as hemlocks die and they're replaced by other species, uh, there are wildlife changes which are somewhat predictable, actually, if you know what the habitat is. In that particular case, the black-throated green warbler uh, was a species that's primarily associated with hemlock forests. This is in Connecticut. And so they had a 93% decline in that species as the hemlock started to decline. So it's definitely going to change the wildlife species. Um, you can have a reversal of natural succession. This photo here shows an oak forest with a hemlock uh, underneath it. This would be the natural course of succession. Oaks don't reproduce all that well in the shade. Uh, they came back at, after land clearing, as Jeremy mentioned. Uh, the hemlock would be undergrowing them. In normal succession, these hemlocks would continue to grow, and they eventually would shade out the oaks. This would become a hemlock forest. But if an insect is killing the hemlocks, then that succession is basically uh, set back and we don't get the hemlock forest in the landscape. Another thing about hemlock forests is they often grow along streams. Um, they need the moisture and they're, they're tolerant of the rocky soils that are often around streams. And as a result, they shade the stream, they keep it cool. And so that if they are lost and you get more sunlight into the stream, higher temperatures, that can affect uh, fish populations, especially fish that really like cold temperatures like, like brook trout. So, so, so a little bug is having ramifications throughout the whole, the whole ecosystem. Control of hemlock woolly adelgid. So it is certainly possible this is an insect, and it's a surface feeding insect, which makes it amenable to control by, by chemicals. So there are you know, insecticidal soaps, there are horticultural oils that you can spray on a tree and basically knock back this population. You have to continue to do it once a year or so in order to keep the population down. But um, it is certainly possible to do that. You can do that on a tree that you want to save. You can't do that on the whole forest, obviously. That's, that's impractical. So if you have a hemlock tree, uh, you can certainly treat it. If you have a hemlock forest, uh, it's not going to work so well. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not a registered pesticide applicator or anything. That's not my expertise. But there's certainly a lot of information out there. Uh, a good one is the Forest Health Fact Sheet uh, from the Pennsylvania uh, DCNR. So if you just uh, Google this, uh, Google DCNR with that number there, you can, this will come up and it gives you a lot of useful information on what to do if you have hemlocks on your property. 
Um, as Charlie mentioned, biological control is the gold standard here. This is, if, we're never going to get rid of the hemlock really doesn't in the landscape. It's too, it's too well established. And, and we're never going to be able to chemically treat all the, all the, all the, species, uh, the trees in the forest, and we wouldn't want to do that. The, the effects of that are, are just too large. Um, so biological control is the way we'd have to go, and there are a number of biological control agents that are being tried, mostly beetles that feed on these adelphi. Um, the, probably the most uh, promising one now is a, is a beetle that comes from the Pacific Northwest. The most recent data suggests that while the hemlock woolly adelgid that we have in the east was imported from Asia, there were perhaps some native hemlock woolly adelgids in the northwestern U.S. Uh, the hemlocks that they have there seem to be more resistant, and there are native insects that, that feed on them. Um, this, this beetle, Arcobius nigrinus, is a very, very small beetle, but anyway, it plows along through this, this woolly stuff and eats the eggs and eats the larvae. So. Uh, this is one possibility. It's not widespread yet. The test they've done so far, they've, they've released the beetle. They can see that it eats the hemlock woolly adelgid. They see that it survives, but nowhere yet has it really controlled the hemlock woolly adelgid population. So we don't know what's going to happen to that in, in the future. So, and, and they're not widely disturbed, so you can't get biological control agents for your property. Now I'm going to move on to another one, emerald ash borer. This is another one you've probably heard of. It's sort of a pest lump around here. Um, because it's just moving into this area. This is a, a little beetle. You can get the scale here from the, from the fingers, unless those are really huge fingers, I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, so it's a tiny little green beetle, and it's very pretty. You can see, if, you, if it wasn't so destructive, you'd be really impressed with the, how pretty this beetle is. Now, this is the larva that does the damage, really, and this is what it does to your ash tree. So it gets under the bark, bores around with all these little grooves, and basically eats the living tissue up from under the bark, and that eventually kills the tree. Um, one of the diagnostic signs is these little D-shaped uh, exit holes. That's when the larvae matures and the adult comes out. Uh, it makes this little exit hole in the bark, and it's got this D-shape with a flat top and a, and a curved bottom. So those little, those little holes are pretty diagnostic. Another diagnostic thing is, that, is the woodpeckers going after the tree. Um, they, they can hear these larvae crawling around in there, and they just start uh, nailing the tree. So uh, if you have a lot of woodpeckers and you start to see this First of all, you have to diagnose that it's an ash tree. You have to be able to tell that it's an ash tree. Uh, and you see the woodpeckers on it, you see these holes. It's a pretty good sign. Um, so the, the, the uh, emerald ash borer was introduced into the Detroit, Michigan area. They think the introduction was somewhere around 1995, and it probably came in on wood packing material that was being delivered by ship to Detroit. Uh, they didn't really discover the outbreak that, until about 2002, when it was already fairly well established in the Detroit area that tried to stop it but couldn't, and it's really spread throughout the Midwest. All the areas that are in yellow have, have uh, emerald ash borer now. And you can see that it's jumped a few places. The spread of the insect, it flies, so it can spread by itself, but the long distance spread is largely driven by people moving firewood around. So what happens is, you know, somebody in Ohio in an area that has ash, uh, emerald ash borer in it will decide to go camping in New York State. They'll bring their firewood with them. Um, you know, maybe they don't burn all the firewood, they leave it in the campground and boom, the thing's out and so it jumps ahead. So a lot of the forward um, explosions of this pest are around campgrounds. And we've had some in this area, and I'm going to give you a blow up view. This is from the, this is from the uh, DEC's most recent map of where the emerald ash borer is in this area. So you can get your bearings here, Pleasant Valley. Uh, here's Hyde Park, and back, so here's the river going down here. All these red spots. Uh, are places where they've detected emerald ash borer in this area. And this is, a, this is an explosion, an outbreak they first found in, in Saugerties area, near Kent. Um, so these are all places where they found uh, emerald ash borer. The black area here is the area that they think is basically infested. The red areas they think is at high risk. That's within five miles of the, of the current infestation. Uh, the more orange area around here they think is still at, at uh, significant risk. So. So it's because this thing does jump ahead and it does move by itself. So you can see that the, the uh, infestation is in our area. Uh, Millbrook itself is down over here. So uh, it's not exactly in this area yet, but it's certainly up along the way. Impacts of the emerald ash borer. Well, we know that ash is a, is a common but not a dominant tree in, in most of the forests of, the, of New York State. It's about 7% of the trees in New York and about 4% of the trees in Connecticut, according to the Forest Service data. Um, 
It can, but it can be dominant in certain areas, particularly wetlands. So there's a lot of green ash in wetlands, and also successional forest because it is a light demanding tree. It often comes back after cutting. Um, the, the emerald ash borer appears to be um, at least 99% lethal to most of the ash species. And we're talking on the whole genus of ash here, about four different ash species in the eastern US. It seems to be 99% lethal, with, with possibility one species, blue ash, which occurs mostly in the Midwest, having some more resistance. But for the most part, it kills 99% of the trees and it kills them fairly quickly. Um, so, but that, that 1%, that's, that's important because that's the future of the genetic stock of ash for our, um, for our, uh, you know, our future forests. So, um, so that includes, that 1% includes both trees that it seem to be resistant to the bug. In other words, the bug doesn't attack them. And trees that we would call tolerant, that is the bug attacks them, but it doesn't kill them. And so, you know, one, one, certainly one point is that um, if we cut down all the ash trees, in advance of this pest in order to keep the value of the ash in order to be able to sell it. Uh, we, we don't know which, which trees are in the 1%. Which we, don't, we have no way of telling a priori which ones are going to be resistant. So if you come all down, uh, there certainly will be uh, no future to ash. If we, if we allow at least some, some places for this, this disease to take its course, then those that survive will produce progeny and still probably <coughs> ash on the landscape. Um, so some, what about some more current sorts of effects? That, there's been some study in Ohio, lots of uh, studies on, on what happens as the as the forest, uh, the ash and forest decline. Uh, one that I saw recently was this uh, study of bird communities. So here's a gradient of ash decline from healthy forest, those starting to decline, further decline, and eventually all the ash trees die and it becomes sort of a shrubby understory underneath. And the student that was giving the talk was talking about the change in bird species that happened. So at the, in this forest here, you tend to have forests that are um, dominated by, by species that like a full forest cover. This is an oven bird. In that area, the blue-gray gnat catcher is an understory species in closed canopy forest. As the trees start to die, other birds will benefit. These will, <coughs> these will um, go away, basically. Uh, other birds will benefit as things like cavity nesters, uh, and this is a red-bellied woodpecker, uh, will feed on the insects itself, also nest in the cavities in the dying trees. So this benefits as the forest declines. As you get uh, more of an open forest like that, you get general species in, like cardinals and catbirds, that can uh, colonize a variety of habitats. And finally, you get to these forests where the, the, the trees themselves, the overstory trees, are dead. Uh, there's understory shrubs. And you get species like Baltimore Orioles that uh, tend to like park-like open, open uh, canopies, and uh, yellow warblers, which nest in more shrubby habitats. So you have a change in bird species composition I mean, you can't say that's good or that's bad. It's certainly bad from the perspective of the tree, but you know, we just there's different birds that colonize different habitats, and those are going to change as the trees change. Control of emerald ash borer. Well, so, certainly one thing you can do is is not move firewood around. And you see, if you go to a campground uh, in anywhere in New York State or in the states around here, you'll see signs about not burning any firewood. So it's actually illegal to move it around at this point. Uh, so certainly you don't want to do that. And there's actually a firewood industry. I don't know if it's a firewood industry, but there's firewood dealers that ship firewood all over the uh, all over the eastern U.S. and those are being more tightly regulated now. Um, uh, there's general inf good general information and uh, on the uh, DEC website. Uh, if you just do Google New York State DEC EAB, um, you'll get you'll get that information. Um, uh, and they also like you to report infestations, especially if you're in an area that, that hasn't had infestations in the past. So if you think you've got one, uh, you can either call the DEC uh, forester and, and, and report it, or you, on this website, there's a form you can use to report it. And they'll come out and check it out. Um, there are also ways of chemical control. This is not a surface feeding insect, so you can't use the oils and soaps and things that we could on I'm not going to go into We're talking about injectable uh, insecticides. Those are dangerous to use. They have to be used by a professional, but there's a lot of information on uh, emeraldashboard.info if you want to go take a look at it there. And again, biological control is the future of the, of the, of the issue here. And biological control, of course, is, is uh, very powerful, also potentially risky. Uh, so uh, that's still an experimental phase. They're using it for, for emerald ash borer, they're using a very small parasitic wasp. So it's a wasp that doesn't sting people, but it lays its eggs in emerald ash borer larvae and eggs and kills them. <coughs> so they're trying to get that going. 
Um, so there's other, there are other insects that have their eye on your forest. Uh, this is one of them. This is a, a headshot of a, an Asian longhorn beetle. Um, and as Charlie mentioned, there's been a number of outbreaks of this thing. Uh, it's a big beetle. This is one you wouldn't miss. It's as big as your thumb, basically. Um, but uh, kind of pretty in itself. It has uh, white spots all over it. It has these long horns, which are antennae coming out. Uh, in Asia, where it comes from, they call it the starry night beetle. So they kind of like it up in there, I guess. Um, there have been outbreaks of this insect in forests in Queens, Manhattan, New Jersey, Chicago, Toronto, Bethel, Ohio, and Worcester, Mass. The Worcester, Mass is the latest big one. It started in 2008. Uh, so far, they've cut down 30,000 trees in Worcester, Mass uh, to try to get rid of this thing. Here's a picture of the neighborhood before they came through and after they came through. So you can imagine the effect on your neighborhood if this thing gets out, right? Because the property value is just the quality of life in the neighborhood is, you know, a lot of that depends on the trees that are available. Um, so these can be, they're still working on this outbreak, actually. They're still cutting trees. So, you know, these things can be devastating. And, there's been some estimates of the economic value, uh, economic cost of all these pests, and it's not, it's not fully worked out yet. In fact, Charlie's got a research project where he's working with some economists to try to expand the, our knowledge of the economic cost. But this one estimate came to about five billion a year we're spending uh, battling forest pests and pathogens. And most of that cost is being borne by homeowners, by loss of property value, the cost of taking down trees, and also by municipalities that have to take down street trees. So, um, this, is, this is not being um, borne by the, the uh, industry that's importing these things. So, uh, so that's where this problem can be solved. So the eradication of established, press, established pests is virtually impossible. We can slow their spread by things like uh, not moving farther around, and we can buy some time. And buying that time may help the uh, development of biological control agents, which, as I've said, are the main hope future for getting rid of these things. And biological control has a lot of potential, but it is difficult to find the right uh, uh, agent to control any particular insect, and it's almost impossible for forest diseases. Um, it's also risky, as you can imagine, you're importing another insect or another disease to, uh, to take care of the one that's been uh, introduced, so that has the potential of getting out. And of course, there's been some spectacular failures where where things have been introduced and caused more problems than, they, than they were, uh, the original uh, insect was causing. So, uh, in my view, we should be focusing on the next pest, not the last one. Uh, so we should be trying to um, stop the introduction of future uh, pests. And in order to do that, we need some action at the federal level, level, because the main vectors that are bringing these things in are the importation of live plants for planting uh, in the nursery trade, and also the importation of wood packing material. So uh, those are the things that need to change, and those are all based on sort of federal regulations and federal control of uh, customs and things like that. So what can you do about this? Well, certainly one thing you can use is stop the demand for non-native plants. So if you, you've heard this from other um, people in the past, I'm sure that it's much better if you use native rather than imported, rather than imported plants in landscaping. You know, the hemlock woolly delta is a great example. It was brought in by someone wanting an important plant in the yard. Um, don't move firewood around. If you're managing a forest in response to pest outbreaks, there's a couple things you can consider. One is the impacts of the harvesting itself uh, on the ecosystem. It's not just the impact of the pest, but the impact of the harvesting. That can be minimized if you, if you do the harvesting well and you use a forester to guide you in that. Um, if you're planning to use pesticides, there, of course, there are impacts of those pesticides that you need to consider as well. I pointed you to a lot of information on this. Um, and also you need to consider the long-term health of the tree population. I made the point earlier about uh, emerald ash borer having a 1% uh, survival rate in the face of this insect. We'd like to maintain that 1% but we don't know which trees they are. And of course probably the main thing to do is contact your representatives in Congress since it's really the importation of these pests is a federal issue. It's really not on the radar screen of any of any uh, congressional uh, people that I know of at this point. So it's, it's really a, 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 uh, an issue that's not getting the policy attention that it deserves. So that's one thing we're trying to rectify. Uh, the Cary Institute is now starting, uh, first of all, we do quite a bit of research on the impacts of forest pests. Charlie does this research, and I do, and Shannon do, and Kathy Weathers. We've all been working on the impacts of these pests. 
But we're also starting an initiative to sort of summarize the scientific and economic information on these pests and using it in an outreach campaign so that we can sort of raise the profile of the issue amongst the media and federal agencies and, and uh, legislators so that we can hopefully uh, stimulate some policy action on the issue. That's, that's where we're headed with that. We're just starting that out. We have a workshop next month on this to try to start to pull it together. So that's where we're at. Um, I'm all done, so thank you for listening. Happy to take up. So it eats a number of different hardwood uh, species, but its favorite is maple. It, it so, host species include 42% of the biomass of trees in eastern North America. But most of, most of, in Worcester, most of the trees they've taken down have been maples and primarily red maples. Over here. Can you talk about what's going on with that 1% that has some resistance? To, I'm sure it's you know, not a, a binary thing. Resistant or not, it's more of a gradient. Right. But it seems easy enough to find the ones that are most resistant and plant. Yeah, so uh, we're, if we're talking about uh, uh, ash in the forest, they're basically uh, planting themselves, right? Uh, what we'd like to be able to do is screen for the ones that are going to be resistant, and that would mean you have to understand what it is that's causing the resistance. As far as I know, we don't, I haven't seen any research that identifies the cause of the resistance. At this point, so we don't, we don't, we can't really go ahead and say, okay, this is a tree that's going to be resistant, and this one's not. We sort of have to let the beetle tell us uh, which one. It probably has to do something with the chemistry of the bark. Uh, we don't know exactly which compound it is, but it does give you hope that there is a possibility for ash remaining on the landscape. But obviously, we're going to go through a period in which there are very few ash around. Yeah. One more before the break. Go ahead. Well, in your research on the impact of the changes in forest structure. Um, and say there's been some good research on that. For instance, uh, in the Delaware Water Gap National Park, there's been some research on hemlock woolly adelgid. As the hemlock declines, they get a lot of invasive species. In. So you can have change in habitat structure with you know, invasive plant species coming in to replace the hemlock. Um, it's, whether the, you know, the, the abundance of prey animals and predators and so forth really depends on which species replace the one that's declining. And, so, and that will be pretty unique in each case. So if you have hemlock mixed, mixed with beech, uh, it'll probably be beech that takes over. If you have hemlock in, in southern New England, they're finding that uh, yep, uh, black birch is the species that takes over. And that's a totally different species, fast growing, open canopy. So they'll have a totally different um, population of animals. I don't think we can predict in general, but we can certainly say that there's going to be large changes in those animal populations. Um, is there anything okay. that okay. we, uh, I'll, be, I'll be outside and answer We want to give you time for a short break here, uh, and we have arrived at that moment. Uh, so we'll reconvene in here at 11, and uh,